so I won't be long tonight, definitely less than three hours. I was, uh, you're supposed to laugh when I say stuff like that. I appreciate a couple weeks ago, uh, Brother Friesen, uh, preaching on Sunday night. I was a little concerned, though. I preached in Sherwood Park that night, and after the service, their service starts at 5 o'clock there. And after the service, I was talking to folks, and I, I clicked on our Facebook Live, on our live stream. I thought, well, I'll see if I can catch the last couple minutes of the service. And it was over. And I told my wife, I said, I'm worried. She said, what are you worried about? I said, I'm worried that they probably had a business meeting tonight. Brother Friesen only preached for 15 minutes, and they voted him in as the pastor. So I was glad to find out that I, I still uh, was the pastor when we got here. But thank you so much. Appreciate Brother Friesen and his faithfulness uh, to the Word of God. Thank you all so much. Take your Bibles here to Matthew 14. And I'm not, as I mentioned, I'm not going to be long tonight. Amen. Oh, you declined. <laughs> they didn't offer him a good enough package. That's what it was. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, Matthew 14. Matthew 14. How many of you realize that we are in our world in days of crisis? And I'm not talking about a, a virus. I'm not talking about uh, any outside forces and a government. I'm talking about we are, I believe, in last days. Uh, I believe very, very soon. The Lord may return. As I look at Christians around the world, and we're, we're so insulated. We, we have it so easy. And I, I know you don't want to hear that. And I don't want to hear it. But we have it so easy here. It's easy for us to feel pretty insulated. But in much of the world, it's a dangerous thing to really be a Christian. It's a battle. It's a struggle. And on top of that, we live in a world that is cursed by sin. And by the way, the world's not getting better. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse and worse. And I, I don't care what news you hear or uh, what is promoted in our culture or our government. The world's not getting better. It's getting worse. Now, with all of that stewing together, with the political climate and all the issues around and uh, all the problems of the world and uh, persecuted Christians around the world and uh, probably coming soon to a country near you as well. Here's the question. How do we handle crisis? Christian, how do you handle crisis? What's your crisis response plan? It was interesting, I've been planning on speaking on this for a while, and tonight, 10 minutes before the service, I got a phone call. We dealt with Alberta Health Services with uh, some issues the last couple of weeks, and they've been phenomenal uh, to deal with. Matter of fact, I got a, the guy I talked with today told me, said, Pastor, thank you so much. You've, you've pointed out something that we need to fix, and you're a help to us. I've passed that along. Uh, they've been great to deal with. And the thing we were discussing was crisis uh, plan tonight, just for a few moments. And I thought how fitting that the Lord would bring that up just as a reminder right before the message tonight. But I want to ask you, not, not, not Cornerstone Baptist Church, not, not your family, not some other person, but you personally, what's your personal crisis response plan. Let's pray together. Lord, as we look in the Word of God, I pray you'd help us. Lord, I'm sure glad that there is no crisis greater than you. I'm sure glad that I can have peace in the midst of a storm. And Lord, that doesn't negate the fact that we're going to go through storms. That doesn't change the fact that we're going to be in the midst of crisis individually. Lord, I pray that we would look in Scripture tonight and, and develop a biblical plan for dealing with the crises of life. 
Lord, help us this evening. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You can start in Genesis and read through Revelation and find that there are many times you will find people in crisis. You'll find the confrontation of Pharaoh's army. When God's people have left Egypt, they, they've got out. They're free, they think. And all of a sudden they look behind them and they see the dust cloud of Pharaoh's army coming and they turn to this side and they're penned against the sea. That's a crisis. That was a serious crisis for the children of Israel. We could look, and we looked this morning at Samson. We could see several battles that came about during the time of the judges. We find horrible situations because God's people drifted away from God, and God allowed those to come in, uh, and He brought judges to bring them back to Him. And as soon as they came back, what happened? <laughs> they wandered away from the Lord again. It's like a ping pong match, watching God's people go away from God and come back to God, go away from God, come back to God. Crisis after crisis after crisis after crisis in the book of Judges. In the days of Rehoboam, we have the division of the kingdoms. Imagine the, the schism that was in the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, the division. It was a crisis for the nation of Israel. Imagine during the days of early days of our Lord as he walked this earth when he was but a boy. Imagine all the little boys that were murdered because he was trying to kill, Herod was trying to kill Jesus. We don't think about that because it's a little blurb we read through in Scripture and we pass by it and we go on to Jesus in the temple, and getting left, and his family, uh, Mary and Joseph, coming back to get him. But can I tell you that the crisis in all the land was that little boys were being slaughtered. It was a great crisis. There's a whole lot of crises, crises in the Bible. The disciples, those men that traveled and walked and taught and ate and ministered with Jesus Christ, they they would end up in a lot of crisis. But even with the Lord, I, I want you to look here quickly in Matthew chapter 24. At just one crisis, we could spend time looking at a bunch, but just quickly, I want to give you some very, very simple, very, very rubber meets the road points of some crisis response plans that we need to have as believers. Look with me here in verse number 22. The Bible tells us, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night... Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Now, I've walked on frozen water, but Jesus walked on the sea. A little different there. Imagine being able to fish walking on the water. That'd be awesome. Man, i got to see if the Lord will let me do that. Verse 26, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were excited to see Jesus. I hope you're looking at me like, Pastor, I don't think you can read. Because the Bible tells us there they were troubled. They were troubled, saying it is a spirit. I want you to notice this. And they cried out in fear. They're out in the water, in the dark. They look out, and they saw something they've never seen before. These men who had spent their lives as youth and growing up as adult men on the sea. And they saw something they have never seen before, and no one else has ever seen before. 
they saw a man walking on the water. And they were scared to death. They thought they were in the crisis of their lives. Notice the rest of the verse here. They cried out in fear, verse 27, but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if thou be, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying of a truth, Thou art the Son of God. And when they were gone over, they came to the land of the Genesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into the country round about and brought in him all that were diseased. And besought him that they may only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Lord, help us as we look here in your word. Be glorified. Amen. We see here some things about the disciples. About a crisis, they thought. And let's get that foundationally understood. When we think we are in a crisis, God's still in control. And that's vital. Uh, that, that's so vital we understand when we're concerned. By the way, when you're on an airplane and the airplane gets turbulence and you're, ah, 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 and you're scared, you know, you know what the pilot's doing? He's up there sipping his coffee. Oh, another flight. He's okay. He's not afraid. Why? He's flown there before. We get scared. And they go, no, we're, we're going to die. Now, the disciples thought they were in a crisis. They were troubled. Now, Christian, can I tell you tonight that you're going to go through times of crisis? I'm not trying to downplay the crises of your life. But in the big picture of life, the crises that we focus on as being so big in scope of eternity become pretty small. But there's some pretty big crisis, a pretty big crisis that we're going to run into. Just like the Titanic that hit that iceberg. You're going to hit the iceberg of crisis. Maybe it's a health problem. So, Pastor, how could you say the health problem is a small thing? Just as I talked about tonight, Miss Lois' sister Laverne, she got healed today. The health problem was a big problem, but it's not a big problem anymore. But in the midst of it, it's a big crisis. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's loss of a loved one. I'm reminded of Elizabeth, one of her, the, the girl that has become her best friend in college. Her grandfather passed away last night. She's going to have to leave college and go and stay with a family member. and She's in a crisis. Some of you have been in those kind of crises before. And you'll be in them again. Maybe uh, that C word cancer, maybe heart problems, maybe a, a child that breaks your heart, maybe it's you go to work and you find out, no, we got to let you go. We all go through those crises of life. I want us tonight just to take a moment and see just some very simple points, and I, I hope tonight you'll get this truth because we need it desperately in the days and weeks to come. Number one, look at verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. Number one, as we try to develop a crisis response plan for ourselves personally, number one, have faith, not fear. Have faith, not fear. What was the knee-jerk reaction of the disciples? Ah! I'm afraid. I'm scared. Do you know that's your knee-jerk reaction too, and that's my knee-jerk reaction? That's what the natural man wants to do. 
when we face crisis, we want to be fearful. But God wants us to have faith. Verse 27, what did Jesus say? Be of good cheer. Notice the rest of the verse. It's I. What did Jesus tell him? Be not afraid. Don't be afraid. Christian, you don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be fearful. I don't have to face crises of life like the lost world. I have my Heavenly Father with me, as I remind, as I shared with you a few weeks ago, uh, dear saint of God, a friend, uh, assistant pastor, who, uh, for 50-some years, the church where I went to Bible college went to heaven a couple weeks ago. And I heard the story, a dear friend of mine who was with his wife when she went in to see him right after he passed away. She went over to, to him and she kissed his forehead and she looked at my dear friend, with John Francis, and she said, John, won't you pray for us? And she said, you don't need to pray for him. He's okay. Can I tell you, we're okay in Christ's hands. I don't have to be fearful. I may not know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds that tomorrow. I don't have to have fear. I don't have to respond to the crisis of life by living in fear. I can live by faith and the faith of the Son of God. How do I respond to crisis? How do you respond to the crisis of life? And they come. Number one, faith, not fear. Verse 31, O thou of little faith, Jesus said to Peter, wherefore didst thou doubt? I wonder how many times our Lord has had to look at me and had to look at you when we go through the crisis of life and go, how little is your faith? Why why would you doubt me? Why would you doubt? I've got you in my hand, and I'm in the Father, and no man can pluck you out of my hand. Jesus said to Peter, why do you doubt? Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going, our flesh is not going to respond in fear. We're not going to have a fearful reaction. But fear alone is not the answer. Don't live in fear. You're going to travel through fear, you're going to step through areas of fear. The Bible speaks of the valley of the shadow of death, it's a fearful place. But the Bible says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Christian, if you're living in fear, you're living in the wrong place. You're living outside the boundary of God's word. God's response for us is not to live in fear, but it's to live in faith. To live in faith, trusting him. The Bible says they cried out in fear. They, when they saw the winds and the waves boisterous, Peter was afraid of the storm. He was afraid of whatever Jesus was. They thought he was a ghost. Then he was afraid of the weather. Then they were afraid. Peter was afraid when he began to sink. Oh, I'm, I'm going to die. He was afraid for himself. And yet the Lord rebuked him. And I believe the Lord rebukes us. When we live and act in fear when God wants us to live in faith. There was fear on the faces of every man in that boat. But the faith in their heart was really small. A Christian, I've been there. I faced the crises of life with fear when God wants us to walk in faith. We need to be prepared. We need to understand the crisis will come And when it does, trust Him. When it does, realize that you can put your faith and your trust in Him. Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Miss Lois, I'm sure you remember Dr. Lee Robertson. Dr. Robertson's been in heaven many years. 
Every time I think of Dr. Robertson, most of the times I heard him preach, can I tell you what I heard this, that great man of God preach on? Miss Lois, I'll tell you, faith. Have faith in God. Simple message. But a man who had faith in God. Christian, Jesus said, have faith in God. Faith, not fear. Number two, what's our crisis response? What should it be? Number one, faith, not fear. Number two, pray, not panic. Pray, not panic. The disciples went into panic mode. Peter went into panic mode mode. When panic takes over, and get this statement, when panic takes over and rules your heart and rules your life, prayer ceases. When panic is in the driver's seat, prayer can't guide your life. There's, there's no such thing as panic and prayer. It's one or the other. Because if I'm panicking, I'm not trusting the Lord. I'm, I'm not calling out to the Lord. I, I'm not asking God to be involved in my life. I'm acting out the raw emotion without faith. Number one, I said we have to have faith, not fear. Number two, we have to have prayer. Hey, what happens when we face a giant crisis? How do we deal with it? What are we going to do? I tell you what you better plan on. You better plan on prayer. You better plan on, okay, I've got to go to God. What are we going to do? I'm going to go to God. I'm going to pray. Because He's the only one that has the answer. He's the only one that can guide you through those dark waters and those dark valleys of crisis. But we don't go to Him. We don't always respond correctly. Prayer, not panic. Number three, and I hurry here. This is big. And those of you that will really be honest with yourself, that have gone through some dark days and some problems and some heartaches and some trials, you'll confess that this is easy to do. Number three, Believe in God, don't blame God. Hey, can I just tell you what we're inclined to do? We want to blame God. When the doctor says, I'm sorry, sir, you have cancer. What do we want to do? God, why did you allow this to happen? When we have financial struggle, when we have family problems, when we face giant obstacles that look insurmountable, we want to blame God. Christian, we need to plan and have a plan of a response in the midst of our crisis to believe God, don't blame God. God tells us in the book of Romans that all things, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. My pastor used to tell us a story of sitting on the floor and looking up at his mom as she would sit in the only chair in their house. He grew up in the Great Depression. His father was a drunkard, and his father left him and his mother alone. They had almost nothing. In that little, small little shack that they called a home, they had one chair. And his mother, who worked two jobs to pay the bills for her and her children, at night would sit and do needlepoint work in that one chair by the light of a candle to sell that needlepoint work to make more money to feed her children. I heard him many times tell the story of how he'd sit on the floor. He'd look up at the back side of that needlepoint work in the chair where his mom was working, and he would say, Mama, how come there's so many black threads? Why don't you use some pretty colors? How come there's so many knots? How come there's so many frays? 
And he said he would complain to his mom. And she said, just wait. When I'm all done, I'll pick you up and put you on my lap. And I'll let you see it from my side. If you've done needlepoint or seen needlepoint, the backside's ugly. The top side's beautiful. Dear friend, can I tell you that one day, one day your Heavenly Father is going to pick you up. And He's going to put you on His side. And I'm going to get to see all those dark threads of my life. And all those difficult crises of life that we got angry with God about were so God could make something beautiful on His side. How do we respond? Number one, faith, not fear. Number two, pray, don't panic. Number three, how do we deal with crisis? Believe in God, don't blame God. By the way, I don't know the reasons. I don't have the answers, but God does, and I can trust Him. Number four, what should be our crisis response to the crises of life? Number four, respond positively. Don't rebel against God. You see, the next step after blaming God is we get angry with God and we want to rebel. We want to go against God. If we make a plan now, remember Job? Job said, yea, though he slay me, I'm going to serve him. Christian, make a decision that even in the midst of the most unthinkable trial, don't rebel against God. Don't use the crises of life as an excuse to disobey this book. Don't use the dark days of your life as an excuse to honor the devil. Live for him. Lastly, number five, and I close with this. What should be our crisis response? Have assurance, not anger. Have assurance not anger. You know, we, different people will say, well, I, you know, he's got an anger problem. She has an anger problem. I'm going to be real honest with you. We all have anger problems. Some of us wind up a little easier than others. Some of us have a shorter fuse than others. Some of us have the dynamite packed a little tighter. But we've all got an anger anger problem. But what's the opposite of anger? Assurance. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Be assured, Christian, that God always does the right thing. Be assured that God is always in control. Be assured that God is never going to abdicate His throne. Be assured that everything God does, He does for His good. Be assured that everything God does is holy. Anger, God says be angry and sin not. What's that mean? Our anger is not to be directed at people. When I direct my anger at people, I'm sinning. I can be angry with sin, but I'm not to be angry with sinners. You know, our flesh wants to be angry with those who hurt us and those who harm us and and those who harm the cause of Christ. But you won't find that in the Word of God. No matter how much you want to twist it, it doesn't say it. God wants us to trust Him. When people try to think of some of the worst people in our history, in the last hundred years, if you try to think of someone that is a horrible, vile individual, if I ask you to name a person, many of you would have a name, tip of your tongue. Maybe folks like Adolf Hitler. Different people. Several years ago, I'll tell a story and I'll close. Several years ago, I had the privilege of ministering in the inner city of Chicago. I got to minister in an area called the Albany Park District of Chicago. 
And that area then for several years after, and maybe even now, it was in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most nationalities in one place in all the world. The world, not the U.S., the world. I literally had the opportunity to minister from, to people from all over the world. I remember a family from Jerusalem that I used to visit on, sun, on Saturdays, and they'd come ride my bus to church. I'll never forget one resurrection morning as I was traveling down the Dan Ryan Expressway in Chicago. I looked back, and about halfway back on the left side of the bus was a family from Jerusalem. And right across the aisle from them was a family from Baghdad, former Muslims that came to Christ. It was a privilege to get a minister in such a diverse area. But most of the folks that I had the privilege to minister to were former refugees from Cambodia. Many who had left Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge regime and spent time in Thailand. And from Thailand came to the United States as refugees. I spent several years asking God to let me go and share Christ in Cambodia. I was ready to go. I would have gone at the drop of a hat, but the Lord wouldn't let me drop my hat. But I read a book during those days. The title of that book was Wang Noor. The man that they made a movie, I've never seen the movie, called The Killing Fields, about in the 19, early 1980s, late 1970s. I read the story of his life. I read what he went through in Cambodia. I read the atrocities that many people endured under the leadership of a man by the name of Pol Pot. On the day I was born, March 31st, 1975, the very day of my birth, Mr. Pol Pot led his armies into the capital city of Phnom Penh and took over the country of Cambodia. Horrible abuses. I've got a dear friend whose father, she watched, led into the jungle behind her home as the Khmer Rouge soldiers killed her father. By the way, her daughter is now in Baba College with Lizzie and Helmy. Horrible, horrible atrocities. Things that I wouldn't even speak of in a mixed crowd, things that happened that that man, Pol Pot, was responsible for. There's many men like that in our culture and our history. But can I tell you that the love of God was enough to love a man as wicked and as evil as Pol Pot. That if Pol Pot would have bowed his knee before his life ended and called upon the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, God would have saved him. Now we have trouble with that. We struggle with that. But Christian... We need to have assurance in God, not anger at the world. We need to realize what's truly important. Anger only enhances confusion, misunderstanding. What will we do? Christian, what will you do in crisis? By the way, how will you deal with the crisis in your life now? How will you deal with your culture? How will you deal with the problems and the health issues and and deaths in your family and, and, and financial setbacks. May we respond biblically. May we trust Him and have faith in God. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank You for Your holiness, for Your righteousness. I thank You for Your sovereignty. Lord, I'm so glad that I don't have to navigate unknown waters. But Lord, although I may not know what lies ahead, that God, you do. Although I may not know the crisis that may be on my doorstep, 
the God you have known from eternity past, and you have a purpose and you have a plan. Well, the disciples struggled, and Lord, we struggle. We don't always make right decisions. Lord, we often fail. Lord, would you help us tonight to make a plan of crisis response, a biblical plan, a plan to trust you, a plan to pray, a plan to have faith. Lord, I pray that we would simply lean upon you. Lord, it may be tonight that there's one here that's living in the valley of shadow. One that's dealing with a, a life of fear. Maybe struggling with some anger towards you. Lord, we've all been there. Lord, I pray if that's the case tonight that we'd make things right. I pray that we'd deal with it by faith. And Lord, we'd make decisions, right decisions, scriptural decisions. Lord, I pray you'd work in our hearts. Lord, work in my heart tonight. Lord, may I realize that in the darkest trial that I never walk alone. Lord, that I can trust you. Lord, bless us and work in our hearts. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, would you stand with me this evening? As the music begins to play tonight, the altar's open. You need to come and do business with God. You do so this evening. We can trust Him. Lord, thank you that we can trust you. Lord, I pray for those that are hurting. Lord, I, I weep for those that weep. My heart is broken for those that are heartbroken. But Lord, my heart hurts. And how often our response to the valleys and crises of life hurts you. Lord, help us to act biblically. Help us to honor you. And Lord, I pray you be glorified. Lord, I pray you dismiss us tonight with your grace. Lord, I pray you go with us. Uh, help us to honor you. Lord, I pray you be with us in our business meeting to follow, Lord, that we would everything would be done decently in order. Lord, that we would effectively and efficiently, uh, Lord, obey your purpose for us as a local church. Lord, may it be so. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll dismiss and, and let's see.